and he's the editor of Richard's Vascular Trauma 4th edition. For, them, for more than 40 years, Richard's Vascular Trauma has been surgeon's number one reference for the diagnosis and treatment of vascular injury in both civilian and military settings across the globe. Professor Drasmussen is a vice chair in education and senior associate consultant in vascular surgery at Mayo's Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Prior to joining the Mayo's Clinic, Dr. Rasmussen had a 28 years career in the Air Force during which he directed the Department of Defense Combat Casualty Care Research Program and was professor of surgery and associate dean of research and research at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and the Uniformed Services University of Bethesda, Maryland. Over to you, sir, Professor Drasmussen. Uh, international colleagues and friends, it's nice to see many of you uh, on the video, and um, I look forward to a day when we can meet in person. Um, I congratulate the organizing committee of this uh, forum for such an uh, important, I think, informative uh, and comprehensive uh, set of uh, educational talks and discussion. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more um, specifically. I think I'll, I'll follow uh, Professor Kahn and, and speak a little bit on the specifics of vascular injury and some of our experiences uh, during the recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. This slide depicts schematically the backdrop for these lessons. Uh, and I, I wanna give some experience and I also, uh, from an educational standpoint, wanna provide the audience some literature and some reading material. Mansoor did a nice job of compelling us all to advance our knowledge. And I, I do wanna provide some literature um, and studies that have been done from this experience. Um, from our standpoint in the United States, there's no doubt that um, you know this almost 15 year um, period of combat operations really allowed for a sustained experience in uh, the management of vascular injury and then the capture of data, uh, analysis, adjustments in care, and then even innovation in new products. I want to speak to the group about a couple of new innovations, I think, that are being propelled by this experience later in this talk. Um, this is a specific photograph familiar probably to many on the line of one of the early theater hospitals um, tent hospitals in Balad, Iraq. Um, it's a favorite photo because it's time-stamped uh, in 2005, early, and I suspect there were members of the Australian Defense Force there. I see uh, Dr. Crozer uh, on the line and maybe others of your colleagues. Uh, so I think at this time, the Australian Defense Force as well as uh, the British um, Army uh, was there as well. So uh, another example uh, or time of, of international collaboration. This is, uh, again, inside this, uh, just a flavor of, 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 of some of the setting at this time. This is Tent Hospital. This is our operative board, you know, for Monday, March 7th, I think. Um, I will mention about trying to innovate um, in this setting. This is a friend and colleague, Dr. John Eliason, who's now at the University of Michigan, attempting to do a rudimentary endovascular procedure using a very basic C-arm. Um, for really orthopedic design, probably within a connex or a trailer uh, in this uh, tent hospital. Um, and this is a, a different theater of war. This is uh, the western edge of the Hindu Kush mountains. Many of you may have been to Bagram Air Base in, in Bagram, Afghanistan, uh, also sort of taken from the top of a, a more structured hospital taken probably in 2010 or so. Um, this, this epidemiologic study um, is one of uh, the first of a few papers that I'll reference uh, in which the Department of Defense and its trauma registry quantified um, the epidemiology of vascular trauma um, using the Department of Defense trauma registry. Um, we were able, this group was able to define the modern rate of vascular trauma to be um, several times, several, several orders of magnitude greater than that was that was reported or recorded in previous wartime experiences. Um, it specifically a, a, a rate in this paper of, of roughly 12%. One in a little over one in 10 injured U.S. service members had some form of vascular trauma. Um, this uh, paper was followed up uh, just recently, uh, a few years ago, 
with a more complete analysis of the epidemiology of, of vascular injury in, in both theaters of war. And, and in, in the sort of the summation of these two studies, um, we found that nearly one in five or 18% of injured U.S. service members had some form of vascular injury. That included um, all types of injury to include distal um, injuries in the forearm and, and the leg as well. So it wasn't just major um, proximal axial vascular injuries, but still a significant portion emphasizing the need to have proficiency in the diagnosis and management of, of this uh, life and limb threatening injury pattern. One takeaway that I, I got from, I think that's important to communicate is that, um, you know, extremity vascular injury was the most common, which isn't particularly surprising. Um, but what was interesting was that some form of vascular repair was attempted in over 50% of injuries. So um, while that still may seem uh, small, um, it's a complete shift in the management um, from the World War II dogma of just ligating, you know, um, DeBakey and Simeone after the Second World War. Their experience was that any type of vascular repair was futile um, in an austere situation. And at the time it probably was, but um, we've advanced now with training and techniques and knowledge um, such that in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, um, somewhere between half and two thirds of all injuries, some form of of reperfusion or reconstruction was was attempted. Uh, I think an important takeaway from this publication. Um, as to the causes of death on the battlefield, this this is a familiar paper. We often refer to this as the Eastridge paper um, that looked at the the, the types of uh, the causes of mortality and and those killed in action. Um, and it's many on the line know. Um, this study looked at almost uh, 5,000 wartime casualties. These were KIAs killed in action. And maybe not surprisingly, of those who were killed in, in, in battle, 90%, um, almost 90% died in the pre-hospital environment before they could reach uh, an operating room or resuscitation room. Um, and also maybe not surprising, the vast majority, three quarters were not survivable as, as we reviewed these these uh, with the Armed Forces Medical Examiner's Office, uh, these 4,500 or 5,000 KIAs. Uh, three quarters were not survivable, but was what was important from this um, was that one quarter were. Um, so almost a thousand of the 5,000 were deemed potentially survivable, meaning they did not have a lethal head wound, cardiac wound, did not have total body disruption. Um, and, and really this type of data that, that almost a quarter of those killed in action died of potentially survivable injuries um, created a real focus for innovation, in our systems of care, and then our types of devices and, and, and how we cared for patients. Again, this, pub, this publication came out in 2012, but this sort of knowledge was really visible uh, in smaller types of publications and, and, and registry assessments early in the wars in 2004 and 2005. From the Eastridge study, again, this graph depicts, this graph depicts uh, this, you know, uh, 1,000 potentially survivable injuries, and not surprising to this group, 90% uh, of those died just from hemorrhage. So um, it was this type of fidelity of data, uh, uh, this type of uh, specific data that really propelled um, innovation in both how our systems cared for these patients and then the, the devices and technologies that we aim to bring to bear to you know, those injured uh, uh, and, and, and specifically in the pre-hospital environment. Of the, the hemorrhage, you know, the vast majority were, were, were non-compressible truncal or torso hemorrhage. Um, you know, only 13% died of extremity hemorrhage, which I think probably spoke at the time to the effectiveness of tourniquet use. Um, so that, I think that's important epidemiologic uh, sort of framework that I wanted to provide the audience. Um, I'm going to speak now to just some basic tenets of damage control vascular um, surgery. Um, and, and, and as we shift, I wanna sort of reference a, a sort of, a, as we focus mostly on extremity vascular injury, but certainly this could, this could also be applied to uh, all forms of vascular injury. There's sort of this triad of viability, meaning um, a decision point that a surgeon must make about, you know, in the extremity, exploring the, the vascular injury and in the extremity, stabilizing a fracture. Then there's the decisions about perfusion. Do we, do we ligate it? Do we shunt the injury? Do we, do we try to reconstruct it immediately? 
Um, and, and then certainly, um, you know, ligation is an important damage control maneuver. Um, we don't, I referenced the, the attempts to, to, to repair a half to two thirds of injuries. I think that's a remarkable advance, but it's also important to know that ligating vessels is also often the, the necessary uh, maneuver as a damage control uh, maneuver. Uh, we can fix it, uh, formal vascular repair. I'll talk and show some photos of that. And we can shunt it. Um, I'll mention also temporary vascular shunts. And then, you know, for the extremities also, then sort of the third part of this triad for extremity viability is, is, is whether or not to perform a fasciotomy. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I think it's, I, I start with ligation as an option because I think in austere situations, often ligating a vascular injury for hemorrhage control is, is often the only option we may have. It certainly is more palatable for minor or distal extremity vascular injuries, such as those in redundant circulations like the forearm or the leg. Um, it's also more applicable to minor vascular injuries like uh, the external carotid artery, for example, or minor injuries in the torso or the mesentery. Uh, ligation, as I've mentioned, is a damage control maneuver in some patients, um, especially those with simultaneous life-threatening injuries who need, need to be uh, tended to for, for more and more emergent reasons. You know, the, the larger and the more proximal vessels that one ligates, the more significant or adverse the consequences. Um, and as I'll say, or maybe show a photo in the next slide, you know, continuous wave Doppler is probably, it's sort of an extension. It's a stethoscope for us really. And I think taking a handheld uh, and using a handheld Doppler, I think plays an important role in the decision is whether or not to ligate um, for how long one can ligate and whether or not uh, one needs to uh, reconstruct uh, in, the, in the subsequent 24, 48 hours. This is a, a great historic paper. This is a, for history buffs, this is a good one in the archives of surgery in 1971 by, uh, led at that time by George Lavinson, uh, Norm Rich, who all on the line probably know, and Eugene Strandis, who was really the father of, of ultrasound, duplex ultrasound. Um, and this photo shows uh, George Lavinson in the Vietnam War using a rudimentary Doppler signal to assess the viability of a limb. George sent me these, um, the important mentor and teacher sent me these photographs. Um, this is Dr. Lavinson and, and uh, during uh, the Gulf War in the early 90s, again, using, he was using, wearing a different uniform, but using Doppler to assess uh, the, the foot again. And then this is him uh, in Germany when he was a visiting surgeon, probably in 2004 or five, again, using the continuous wave Doppler as a way to assess viability in an extremity. Um, so I think use of Doppler as part of our physical exam is really important when we talk about um, damage control vascular surgery. This is a, a paper we won't have time to go into, but this is, is a summary of, of, of an example of selective repair of tibial arteries. Uh, the converse of this is selective ligation, meaning that certainly not all tibial artery injuries need to be repaired. Um, this is a summation of about 100 injuries that we published in 2010. Um, kind of confirming our selective approach, um, you know, supporting the selective approach to tibial artery vascularization, meaning that most of the tibial artery injuries could be ligated, but there are a subselect number that, that do need to be reconstructed if, if limb salvage is to be achieved. And I'll refer you to that paper for more in-depth reading. And I think similarly, we have approached venous injury uh, in, a, in a selective way, meaning that, that we repair some, uh, extremity venous injuries, but also many can be ligated. This is a photograph of a right superficial femoral vein that's being repaired with a vein using um, some Gore-Tex suture that doesn't show very well in this photo. I guess here it is. Um, and, and of course, in this type of case, if we're going to reconstruct an extremity vein like this, uh, it's probably an isolated injury. The patient's physiology is, should be normal. And uh, if we're going to take the time to do this sort of a more complex repair, if this patient were in extreme shock or had other life-threatening injuries, this venous injury would just be ligated. Uh, this shows the, uh, I guess, the vein repair. This is probably the, the femoral artery of the right leg sort of encircled. It was spared injury in this case. This is a, 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 another paper that we have published on, on a selective uh, venous uh, repair, showing that it's safe and effective. And if, if extremity veins are repaired and they do thrombose in the subsequent time period, they, they do not lead to DVT, uh, or I'm sorry, they do not lead to pulmonary emboli. 
was I think an important here. So it, this paper again in experience showed or sort of confirmed our selective approach to extremity vein injury. Um, I think, you know, repair and reconstruction, I, we've talked a lot about ligation, uh, but I do think there's certainly, as I mentioned, a half to two thirds of vascular injuries in our epidemiologic assessments were repaired or some form of repair. So this shows a contused right superficial femoral artery that's explored. This is the, the proximal sort of groin is to the right and the knee, I guess, is to the left. Um, these should be approached with wide exposure, proximal control. You can see us beginning to get that here. You see the contused and thrombosed artery, femoral artery in the thigh. As we open this injury, you know, you see the denuded um, thrombus was here. As we removed the thrombus, you see an absence of, of the intima here and uh, the white intima is present here and here, but there is none here. And of course, this then required uh, uh, resection and then repair with a uh, reverse great saphenous vein uh, interposition graft. These are some tools that I think are important as we teach our residents and trainees the, the importance of not just uh, prepping and anticipating the, name, uh, the need for vein harvest. Uh, these are thrombectomy catheters. Uh, one can use a pulmonary artery catheter as well, a balloon to remove a thrombus from the vessel. And these are some rudimentary just vascular clamps and instruments. Um, you know, as we talk to our residents about proximal and distal control, um, you know, sometimes one needs to use balloon control. Uh, the Fogarty or the, or the pulmonary artery catheter can be used at least in small to moderate sized vessels for proximal control. Um, you know, vascular repair is best for uh, proximal, uh, you know, vessels and patients with isolated injuries. So they don't have any other concomitant life-threatening injuries. Um, and especially those scenarios where um, the, the, there's no Doppler signal, um, you know, beyond the, beyond the injury. If there's complete ischemia and it's a proximal vessel, um, you know, repair is likely to need, is, is, is likely needed in order to maintain viability. Not always possible. And again, sometimes primary amputation ligation is needed. Um, but, um, but if possible, vascular repair to include, you know, primary repair of the vessel, patch angioplasty, or as I've, uh, alluded to interposition graft with vein or prosthetic conduit. Vein is almost always preferred, um, as I mentioned here, as, as the conduit. Uh, temporary vascular shunts, I think these are, these are used. Uh, there's a couple of references here on the, this is a great, I think, review led by Norm Rich on the history of vascular shunts. They're best to use to restore perfusion in large proximal vessels. Uh, most useful in scenarios of injury in the setting of other life-threatening injuries. Uh, or sometimes uh, this group will run into two simultaneous vascular injuries in the same patient. Uh, we've certainly had scenarios where we've had both brachial artery injuries for both brachial arteries injured, for example, and you can shunt one and repair the other. Uh, and then Doppler, you know, one should and can use a Doppler, as I mentioned before, to assess the shunts when they're in place uh, for patency and, and their effectiveness. These are some just basic uh, shunts. These are the Argyle shunts that come in an eight, 10, 12, and 14 uh, size. This is a Sunt shunt developed by Thor Sunt here at the Mayo Clinic in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, these shunts are secured either with a vessel loop or silk tie, for example. Um, this is in a photograph of a shunt um, in a right lower extremity. This is actually some documentation that came with this patient you know, showing where the vascular injury was and, and it's sort of his uh, resuscitation. Uh, of course, these shunts then are removed at a higher echelon facility. The shunt was placed at an echelon two facility. It's removed at an echelon three facility and then vascular repair is performed. This is an example in this case of fasciotomies that have been performed. And uh, in this particular case, although the vascular injury has not been repaired, there's a shunt in place that has made the, you know, the, made the, rendered the right lower extremity viable with a palpable pulse. Um, shunts can be put in veins. Uh, this is the superficial femoral artery and vein that were shunted um, at a roll two facility shipped to us and, and we would remove these and then perform repair of both the artery and the vein. These are shunts behind the left knee, again, uh, in the uh, distal superficial femoral or popliteal artery, uh, artery and vein. Um, in this particular case, the shunts could be removed and we did sort of a above to below knee uh, popliteal artery bypass. Um, in cases, this is a reverse great saphenous vein. It's distended, it's sewn into its proximal target and we're pulling it out to length to 
to mark it and to, to get ready to tunnel it behind the knee uh, and, and to perform the distal anastomosis, you know, to the artery behind the knee or below the knee. This is an early publication um, I'll refer you to for our use of temporary vascular shunts, sort of their shows their <clears throat> um, safety and efficacy early in the wars. You know, we've we've published and advocated for early restoration of flow, recognizing that, uh, you know, there's an ischemic threshold of the myocardium for sure. There's obviously an ischemic threshold for the brain. So the idea is there's probably an ischemic neuromuscular ischemic threshold for the extremity as well. And so, you know, there was a good portion of translational research, you know, 10 years ago that really showed and defined the impact of ischemic intervals on neuromuscular re uh, recovery um, in animal models. Um, you know, again, advocating for early restoration of flow with either repair or temporary vascular shunts, you know, within one to three hours, sort of striking back at the dogma of six hours um, and providing data to to emphasize the need for early repair. Um, endovascular capabilities, you know, Monsoor mentioned this briefly. Uh, this is uh, an early publication from the wars in which we demonstrated sort of the implementation, uh, the capability, the ability to do some early rudimentary endo downrange. Um, I don't have time to get into all of that, although it's an interesting topic for sure. This again is this photo of John, you know, Eliason sort of starting some of this. Um, I think it's really the first wars that we've had, prolonged periods of war, where we've had endovascular trained surgeons. Uh, you know, we didn't really have the equipment or the training in, in the Vietnam War, the Gulf War. Um, and so I think there was naturally this push to um, see what was capable or possible uh, from an endo standpoint in these recent wars. You know, these are some examples of, of endo technologies. So obviously, we've, we'll mention briefly the Reboa balloon, but there's also, you know, stent grafts, use of coils and plugs for hemorrhage control that I think are appealing in, in, in addressing non-compressible torso hemorrhage. Um, you know, this is an early um, depiction of the Reboa catheter um, that many are, this is really the generation one catheter. Monsoor mentioned um, that's its use and limitation of distal ischemia. Um, this was really generation one catheter. It's a, a, a compliant balloon that's all or nothing. Um, and I think user, you know, the, we have listened to uh, users uh, who have used uh, the, the device and uh, have done more iterations and have developed a new partial Reboa catheter to, to really mitigate strike at some of the limitations that Monsoor mentioned. Uh, this is, I'll refer you to this uh, publication, but a pressure regulated catheter per, per specifically for partial a long-term or sustained partial Reboa um, that can be done to mitigate distal ischemia and still support left uh, ventricular afterload. This uh, was FDA approved uh, just last year. Uh, this is a separate publication. You know, uh, Hassan Alam at the University of Michigan, he's now at Northwestern, but before he left Ann Arbor, published a couple of interesting reports on this new, what's called the P-Reboa Pro, uh, a partial Reboa specific catheter. The last thing I'll mention in just a couple of slides, another innovation is a new bioengineered vascular conduit. This is called the human acellular vessel. Um, it's really a blood vessel grown in an organ chamber um, from human smooth muscle cells, vascular smooth muscle cells. Um, the HAV is, has been implanted. It's, it's in clinical trials. It's not yet been approved, but we've done, before I left Walter Reed, we implanted five or six of these and then expanded access provisions with the FDA, and we've implanted four or five here at Mayo Clinic uh, since my arrival, uh, mostly for PAD, peripheral arterial disease. This shows uh, two of these vessels sewn together as a conduit. Uh, there's an inner uh, uh, dowel that sort of has slipped out, and then the, the conduit is here in my, in my right hand. You can sew the uh, conduit together using standard suture. Um, we often use Gore-Tex suture, but this is proline. This shows it laid out on a patient's left lower extremity, getting ready for a left femoral to below knee popliteal artery bypass. You know, the military has, a, I think, a significant interest in a biologic conduit um, that could be off the shelf and 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 not require har vein harvest that would be resistant to infection and be more efficient and quickly used. So I'll refer you to this um, paper that was led by Johnny Morrison from the University of Maryland, uh, Jeff Lawson at Duke, um, you know, in 2019 on the human acellular vessel and its military implications. This shows a sewing it to that patient's left femoral artery here. 
Uh, this shows a pulse in the human acellular vessel as we're getting, before we tunnel it, this shows it going through a metallic tunneler to be tunneled to the below knee popliteal position. And then uh, not a great picture, but it's sewn into the below knee popliteal artery. So I think the HAV is an example of another um, innovation that um, has sort of stemmed from the wartime needs. There, certainly these things are relevant to civilian and austere trauma as well, uh, humanitarian trauma as well. And I appreciate the opportunity to review them with you. And uh, I guess these are my conclusions. And uh, again, I'll thank the, the organizing committee for the opportunity to participate. And again, say hello to so many international friends and uh, colleagues. Thank you.